This Faith and Finance podcast is underwritten in part by Christian Healthcare Ministries, a budget-friendly, biblical, and compassionate healthcare cost solution for Christians in all 50 states and around the world. Learn more at chministries.org. As the new year gets underway, many people feel motivated to do things like lose weight, cut back on social media, and yes, get out of debt. Unfortunately, New Year's motivation often wanes quickly. Hi, I'm Rob West, and today I want to give you practical ideas for turning a New Year's resolution into genuine progress, at least in the getting out of debt area. That's just ahead. Then to the phones for your questions on any financial topic. Our number is 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. Well, as you may know, every so often on our program, we like to revisit the five basic things you can do with money. Here they are. You can earn it, live on it, give it away, owe it to someone or the government, or you can grow it for the future by saving and investing. So that's earn, live, give, owe, and grow. Well, today I want to focus on the fourth of those, owe. As I mentioned, a lot of people at the first of the year resolve to get out of debt or at least make progress on reducing their debt. That's a good resolution because debt, especially consumer debt, things like credit cards, put a drag on your overall finances. Uh, Getting those debts paid off will improve your financial situation tremendously and provide a great sense of freedom in your finances. But as I say, motivation often wanes quickly. As we get a few weeks into the year, many resolutions fall by the wayside. So to stay motivated, you need to have a plan. You may remember that a few days ago, I mentioned the idea of making your resolutions smart. That is S-M-A-R-T, and that stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So let's start with this specific thing related to debt. Find out where you are. By that, I mean you need to have a concrete understanding of how much you owe and to whom, along with the terms, including the interest rates. You need to know that because, just to give an example, it'll make much more sense financially to attack a credit card debt that's at 18% than a car loan that's at 3%. Okay, so that's the first thing. Find where you are. As you catalog your debts, I suggest you list them in order from the lowest balance to the highest. Second, and this too is very specific, stop adding to your debt. As the old saying goes, it's hard to get out of a hole if you keep digging deeper. You may want to stop using credit cards and instead move to a debit card or cash for your spending. That'll help you avoid further debt. Now, third, this is an idea from financial writer Matt Bell. He says, tell someone what you're doing. In other words, ask someone to hold you accountable to your plan to get out of debt. It's remarkable how much it helps to have an accountability partner when it comes to following through on what you've committed to doing. Fourth, create a specific plan for paying down your debt. Now, there are different ways to approach this. Perhaps the easiest method is to commit a specific amount to debt reduction each month. Let's say it's $500 and you have five credit cards. Pay at least the minimum balance on four of your cards, but pay as much as you possibly can on the card with the lowest balance. So to continue the example, let's say your minimum payments total $300. So you pay that, but then pay the remaining $200 toward the lowest balance. Balance card. When you focus your payments this way, you'll be able to pay off that lowest balance card soon. Then, when it's paid off, you'll keep paying $500 a month on your debt, but now focus your attention on the new lowest balance card. After a while, when that one is paid off, you keep paying $500 a month and put most of the money toward the new lowest balance card. This approach of fixing your overall payment at the same amount each month and attacking the lowest balance card will create a steady sense of progress that you'll find encouraging. And note how this approach is smart. It's specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. It's not vague at all. It's clear and purposeful. 
Now, after you get all your credit cards paid for, you can then start attacking other debts that may be at much lower interest rates, such as car loans and school loans. If you were paying $500 a month against your credit cards, that $500 is now freed up to accelerate payments on your other debts. This process of creating a systematic plan for paying down debt has worked for many, many people. And again, first, you need to get a clear picture of where you are, then commit to not taking on more debt. And finally, create a clear, easy to implement plan that you can stick with. By the way, it's really important to get an accountability partner. All right, your calls are next, 800-525-7000. Much more to come. Stay with us. If you enjoy this radio program, you're going to love all of the many different resources waiting for you at faithfi.com. You'll find more powerful wisdom, podcasts, articles, videos, and more from partners like the National Christian Foundation, Sound Mind Investing, and Christian Healthcare Ministries. Connect with the community of thousands of Christians striving to be good and faithful stewards and check out all of the free biblical financial advice at faithfi.com. If the heavy burden of debt is robbing you of freedom and peace of mind, Christian Credit Counselors can help. We're a nationwide nonprofit credit counseling organization that has helped over 300,000 individuals in the last 27 years get out of credit card debt 80% faster while honoring that debt in full. To learn how Christian Credit Counselors can help you, visit ChristianCreditCounselors.org. That's ChristianCreditCounselors.org or call 800-557-1985. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West. This is the program where the 2300 verses on money and possessions found in God's Word intersect with today's financial decisions and choices. The number to get in on the conversation, 800-525-7000. 800-525-7000. In just a moment, we'll be in Midway, Florida with Alonzo. But first, Jane is in Chicago, Illinois. And Jane, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. Um, My question is, um, I'm not eligible for full retirement until May, but I am 65. Uh, My hours got cut at work, so I'm going to take my Social Security. But I wanted to know if I should take my husband's survivor benefits or if I should take the benefits that I'm entitled to for myself. Yes, it's a great question. As you probably know, you're entitled to the higher of either of them. However, I would say, Jane, if you can get by by taking your husband's survivor benefits, I would do that. Uh, if you start taking your own benefits a year or two early, it could lower your benefit by as much as 16% permanently, probably more likely 8% if it's a year early. Um, Since you're not yet at full retirement age, the survivor benefit will be reduced until you reach that age, at which time you would get the full survivor benefit. Uh, At that time, then you can compare the benefit to what you would receive from your own work record. And again, you'd be entitled to take the higher of the two. But by taking the survivor benefit, if if, again, it meets your need right now based on those uh, cut in hours, then it could allow your own benefit to grow. And, you know, there's the likelihood, possibility at least, that um, that benefit will be higher when you evaluate the two. And then, of course, you would either continue taking the survivor benefit if it's more or you could move over to your own. But I think that would be one approach. Does that make sense to you? Um It does. Um, Someone told me I should take uh, the survivor until I'm almost 70, and then mine would probably be higher than his. I don't know what either one of these are yet. I have an appointment with Social Security coming up. Okay, very Um, good. Yeah, and and that's certainly another approach as well, because that would allow yours to continue to grow, and then you could uh, have the option to switch over. I'm glad to hear you say you have an appointment, because they're great to work with. Uh, They'll actually pull your actual work record, your high 35, so you can compare what your actual benefit is projected to be both now at full retirement age and if you delay beyond full retirement age and compare that to what you're entitled to for survivor's benefits 
early and at full retirement age, and it will become pretty clear which direction you need to go. But you do have this flexibility of allowing one to continue to grow, taking one now, and then switching. I think the key is just making sure that that budget will balance in the short term so you can cover your obligations. Um, I have, the other question was, I, I'm going to keep working because I do like what I do. Um, um, but they were saying something about I have to pay a dollar for every two dollars I earn, yes. and I was wondering like <laughs> how that all works. I know there's a limit I can make until then, um, but now do I get that money back like in the end, or does that go to the government, or is it taxable, or you know like what happens to that? dollars that I'm going to end up giving them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. So uh, prior to full retirement age, uh, you are going to be limited to roughly $18,000, a little bit more than that in earnings, at which point beyond that, uh, you would be reduced a dollar for every uh, $2 you earn. Um, at that point, that is temporary. Uh, so that reduction, you actually get that money back after full retirement age. They'll kind of add it to your check over time until they've repaid you for everything that you lost. Um, so it's not a permanent reduction. It is temporary, but obviously it, you know, it will impact you and you need to factor that into your planning. So as long as you're aware what, of what it is, again, it's something that um, you will eventually get back over time. And once you reach full retirement age, Jane, uh, you won't have to worry about that anymore. You're free to earn as much as you'd like. So uh, I'm confident you'll sort all of this out in your upcoming meeting, but hopefully this at least gives you some things to think about as you're kind of preparing for that meeting. And uh, the key, I think, as you move forward is to just really have a clear understanding of what is your monthly need, both the fixed expenses, those things you get a bill for, and the discretionary spending, which is what has a tendency to get away, um, and having a, a budget in place and then a plan to control the flow of money in and out is really, really key. So uh, we appreciate your call today. Thank you for listening and all the best in the days ahead. Some phone lines are open, 800-525-7000. Call right now. Jeff's in Chicago, Illinois. Hi, Jeff. How can I help? Hey, uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, love your program. So Thank you. um, I'm getting a couple of years uh, away from retirement. I'm probably uh, 68. And uh, my wife and I were talking, and we're going to uh, interview some financial advisors. And um, I've been on your website and looked at some CKAs. And some say they're fiduciaries. Um, some don't mention it. Uh, I'm not sure I need uh, I need financial and more tax advice and maybe estate planning. I'm not sure I need investment advice, although I'm open to hear about it from somebody. So I'm a little bit confused about, uh, do, do I need a, a fiduciary? And um, maybe you could explain that uh, a little more detail. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is uh, something that's gotten a lot of, uh, well, there's been a lot of discussion about it in the media. And it simply means that this is somebody who's going to put your best interest before their own. Uh, you know, fiduciaries are bound by a fiduciary duty uh, as they recommend in particular investments uh, related to your goals and objectives. And so I think choosing somebody, uh, if, if they're going to manage money for you, that's going to serve in a fiduciary capacity is a good decision. Um, but backing up even before that, Jeff, I think uh, as you've already alluded to, the first thing you have to do is solve for what type of professional do you need based on what you're looking to accomplish. Is it planning, which can be done even on an hourly basis, which removes all bias from the situation because, you know, if an insurance policy is recommended or a particular investment strategy, uh, there's no benefit financially to the advisor or professional in that case because you're simply paying them for their time to help you plan and make decisions moving forward. Uh, is it an estate planning attorney where you can work on wealth transfer issues and legal documents to carry out your estate plan? Uh, is it tax planning or retirement planning or college planning? Or are you looking to delegate or per, can at least consider delegating investment responsibility for your investable assets? And in that case, you would need an investment advisor. And often with a wealth manager, they would combine both the planning and the investments, but that's not necessary depending upon what your needs are. So I think really bringing some clarity into what you're looking for is the first decision. And then based on what you need, clearly if you want
want to consider somebody to take over investment management. At that point, I would be looking for a fiduciary. Um, on the uh, planning side, I would be looking for somebody who you can pay by the hour, and the same would be true for an estate planning attorney. When you get beyond that decision and decide what uh, professional you need, I think somebody who shares your worldview, and uh, that's why we promote the Certified Kingdom Advisor, and then I think a clear understanding, Jeff, of how they're compensated uh, and what is their experience. How are you going to fit into their overall client mix? Are you going to be kind of at the bottom rung or you know near the top? Are they going to uh, involve another advisor in that relationship? I think these are all questions you'll want to include as a part of your discovery. And then clearly they're going to need to ask you a lot of questions to make sure it's a good fit as well. So hopefully that helps you, my friend. Uh, We appreciate your call today, and we'll be back with more calls when faith and finance continue. We are grateful for support from One Ascent Investments on the MoneyWise program. They manage a comprehensive suite of value-based investment strategies designed to help Christian investors live aligned with what they value most. One Ascent believes that if your values inspire the way you live, they should also inspire the way you invest. This can be a unique form of worship. More information is available at investments.oneascent.com. That web address is investments.oneascent.com. Investing is more than just returns. It's an expression of who you are and what you value. Does the way you invest your money reflect your identity as a Christian? At Eventide, we design investments for performance and a better world, so you can invest with a confidence to reach your financial goals while remaining true to your Christian values and commitments. We call this investing that makes the world rejoice. More is available at investeventide.com. That's investeventide.com. We're so glad to have you back with us today on Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West, and we're looking forward to taking your calls and questions. The name of the program has changed, but the phone number's the same. Here it is, 800-525-7000, 800-525-7000. Let's head south to Miami, Florida, or excuse me, Miami Springs. Hi, Carlos. How can I help? Hi. Hello. Uh, uh I've been a listener since the 90s, and thanks to your program, I and thank God and your program, I was able to retire at 51. Now, oh, my wow. question to you is, does it behoove me to get long-term care, or can I use my investments, especially an annuity that I have for that? And the other question is, should I wait till 72 to, no, 70 to get my Social Security? Um my regular retirement uh, Social Security age would be 66 and yeah. 80 yeah, months. Yeah, very good. Well, I'm delighted to hear that uh, you've been a recipient of the wisdom that's been shared on this program well before me because – if you were listening in the 90s, that was uh, Larry Burkett and then Howard Dayton after that. And I walk in the shoes of some giants of the faith with those two men. There's no question about it. But it's God's wisdom that you were able to apply, not uh, any of ours. And uh, that's why you're receiving the uh, the blessing that comes with that. Um, as to long-term care, what is your age, Carlos? And then what do you have in liquid investable assets? I just turned 63 and liquid. Um, I have a Roth IRA. I have a regular IRA. I have an annuity. uh, And I have a 457B plan. uh, Okay. Which, uh, and everything is highly aggressive except the annuity. Okay. And all in, what would you say the total of those accounts is roughly? It would be, uh, um, a little over a million and something, okay. a million and a yeah. half, a million and a half and something. Sure. Very good. Well, you know, as you are well aware, uh, long-term care costs, uh, you know, are continuing to rise. Um, and, you know, if there's something that's going to erode your assets in this season of life, 
it's you know most likely going to be uh, the need that you have for uh, long term care. Um, you know, if you look at you know what the costs are, depending on what type of of care you need. Uh, you know, you're talking about uh, you know a couple of thousand dollars a month to as much as you know seven or eight thousand dollars a month, depending upon what type of care. Uh, you know, in-home care can run you five thousand a month, and nursing home care can run you nine thousand a month. So you know that can add up. Now, on average, most folks don't need that more than two or three years, but it is meaningful. So if you have the ability to get a long-term care insurance policy with an inflation rider that would give you, you know, a daily benefit that would help to offset some of those costs, I think that would be well worth the money that you spend, just given the fact that 70% of 65-year-olds and older will need some form of long-term care. If you can build it into the budget, you know, that could run you $4,000 plus a year for the premium. But again, if you have a need for it, you know, it could really help to offset uh, eroding these assets so you have more to give away and ultimately perhaps even pass on to your heirs. You're at a you're at a good age, Carlos, to look at this. I think between 55 and 65 is the time to do it. Um, so I would check it out. I mean, clearly you're kind of right there on the bubble where, you know, you could probably self-insure in this area, but... Um, you know, with a million and a half dollars, it's a lot of money. There's no doubt about that. But uh, you could go through that in a hurry if you needed, uh, you know, nursing home care uh, for an extended period of time. So uh, I think I could go either way with it. But, um, you know, I think the data would be on the side of of picking up a policy that would help uh, to give you some peace of mind and offset this cost in that season of life. As to whether you should wait to take Social Security until age 70, you know, there's a good case, Carlos, that if you're in good health, um, that you should. And if you don't need the money, you can let that continue to grow uh, by 8% a year. And uh, as long as you live long enough, which, you know, is going to be probably into your 80s, uh, you'll be able to recoup what you gave up uh, between full retirement age and age 70. And then you'll enjoy that higher check for the rest of your life. So unless you need that money, I think there's a great case to be made for you waiting. Uh, Give me uh, any questions you have on either of those. Okay. The question is, if I were to choose, uh, I don't have any heirs. You know, I'm single. I have like eight cats. That's about it. So (laughs) anyways, and I contribute to my church, to other organizations. But the thing is, uh, if I choose to go with a long-term care I've heard said that you should choose a high deductible because usually the stay in a nursing home is like two, three years for and in order to get a lower premium. Yeah, well, usually what you the way you do that is what's called a waiting period before the policy kicks in. So you might have a 30, 60, or a 90-day waiting period where you would fund that out of pocket until it kicks in. And then there's a daily benefit that you would get. So you can kind of use uh, those elements to to get that premium down, especially since you have the ability to cover that out of pocket. So I'd get a long-term care insurance agent that's a real specialist in this area who could help you understand kind of the pieces and parts of what makes up that premium and ultimately come up with the policy that's the right for you right thing for you. So uh, we appreciate your call today, Carlos. Thank you for checking in with us. Uh, Jeff is in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, Jeff, I don't have time to get you right now, but if you hold the line, we'll talk to you off the air. I want to make sure to give you all the time you need to get your question asked. So if you'll hold the line there, Jeff, uh, I'll get to you in just a moment. And that's going to do it for us today. I really appreciate your taking time to listen to this program and to committing the principles we talk about each time to your financial life. You see, God's plan isn't difficult, but it does take discipline, and I hope we can encourage you along the way as you listen to this program. Incidentally, if you've been helped by what you've heard here, would you mind helping us? This broadcast, the FaithFi app, and the other great resources we provide wouldn't be possible without the financial support we receive from listeners like you. 
We offer a lot of our resources for free and even have a free version of the FaithFi app. And that's only possible because of the generous gifts from listeners like you. If you're not yet one of our financial partners but would like to be, would you visit our new website, faithfi.com? That's faithfi.com. And then click the Give button to sign up. We'd certainly be grateful. In the meantime, please set an alarm on your phone and make plans to join us again next time. I'll be here, and I hope you will be too, for the next edition with an all-new name of Faith and Finance. See you then. Faith and Finance is provided by FaithFi and listeners like you.